The morning panel is devoted to the topic of energy usage, and uh, Dave Lawrence will moderate the panel. Dave Lawrence is currently a director of Stone Energy Corporation. Uh, before joining Stone Energy, he served as executive vice president of exploration and commercial for Shell Upstream Americas, and he was the functional head of global exploration for Royal Dutch Shell from 2009 until his retirement in 2013. Dave's also an earth scientist, and he received his doctorate from the Department of Geology and Geophysics here at Yale in 1983. Is that right, Dave, 1983? Uh, I was like 84. Or 84, <laughs> all right. Uh, and uh, we're, we're quite happy to have him here. He's been a, a member of the External Advisory Board for the Yale Climate and Energy Institute since its start in 2009. And I'm also pleased to announce that Dave has accepted our invitation to serve as the new chair of the YCI Advisory Board. So I'll let Dave introduce the rest of the panel. Thanks, Mark. Well, like Neil, uh, it's great to be with this group of panelists who I think represents a, a range of experti expertise and a diversity of views that I think will be greatly beneficial uh, to us. I should say I'm very pleased uh, to take the, uh, this uh, chairmanship role of the External Advisory Board uh, for YCEI. Uh, given the leadership and the direction that it's had in the past and the potential that I see for it to have an impact in not only areas of technology and science, but also in the regulatory space and in the communication space and in policy space. So it's a tremendous institution with a lot of horsepower behind it. And uh, sessions like this, I think, just go a long way towards, uh, towards demonstrating that. Anil, I thought it was great to present us with these shell scenarios. And the shell scenarios provide a plausible, and he really emphasized that, I hope you took that away, plausible scenarios that lead to this amount of energy use by sector, this amount of energy use by different geopolitical realms, and therefore this amount of carbon emissions, and this is different consequences. But I also think that you recognized that in those scenarios there wasn't very much difference in the early years, and in the end, they all resulted in a significantly higher uh, amount of carbon in the atmosphere, which calls for what are some disruptive technologies that may come forward. What will change the rate of market penetration uh, that we see, which is an area of great interest to me. And I'm highly cognizant of, as we look at different introductions of different energy systems that there are things now that we see that we didn't envision 10 years ago. And the quote that we tend to overestimate change in three years and underestimate it in 10 in the energy space I think is highly valid. I like that quote in the comments. But we remember 10 years ago we were looking at LNG imports in the U.S. And now we're looking at LNG exports. The greatest change in the energy space has come in natural gas, which was a dying industry. And now look at, in these scenarios, how much it's taken its role in a 10-year span. It was not like that 10 years ago. So what are the other technologies, what other policies, regulations, things that could cause these scenarios, as Neil so eloquently presented, to change for us? And I think that's why it's great that we've been able to bring forward this panel, which is a uh, panel of, of, again, it's a considerable expertise in a diversity of fields, in a diversity of geographies and sectors. So let me just introduce uh, the panel uh, to you, um, and I'll start with Dan. Uh, Dan is Hill House Professor, Dan Esty, uh, who many of you have met, is Hill House Professor of Environmental Law and Policy with appointments at both the Yale Law School and the Yale School of Forestry and Environmental Studies. He served uh, the state of Connecticut as commissioner of the Connecticut Department of Energy and Environmental Protection. Uh, Dan is also the 
uh, author and editor of numerous uh, publications, highly influential uh, publications, and uh, books including uh, Green to Gold, How Smart Companies Use Environmental Strategies to Innovate, Create Value, and Build. So he'll bring, a, I think, a tremendous perspective to our panel. Uh, Professor Zhang Zilang is one of the leading economists in China, highly influential in one of the most highly influential places on the planet, working on climate <laughs> and energy <laughs> policy. I I'm, I'm, hope I'm not underestimating him. I underestimate in three years, ten years, no. But he is, so he's worth listening to. And uh, he's professor of economics and executive director of the Institute of Energy, Environment, and Economy at Tsinghua University in Beijing. He's, he's authored and led many studies, important studies, and initiatives in China, and was a lead author in the last two IPCC climate change projects. So welcome. So it's a privilege to have you, and thank you for traveling this great distance. Dan did not need to travel a great distance. <laughs> Another great traveler is, uh, is our next panelist is, is Karen Hussey, is an associate professor at the Fenner School of Environment and Society at Australian National University, and an expert on what is now being called the Water Energy Climate Nexus, which also, I thought that was great, Karen, that Neil also raised that important point in his introduction. Uh, she has a book coming out later this year on that topic specifically, so we'll look forward to its publication. Next. Yes, and, and buying that, uh, and it'll be from Cambridge University Press. And she's the author of Environment and Sustainability, a Policy Handbook. So welcome, Karen, thank you again for traveling, and she'll provide us also some unique perspectives. And Luke Tonichel is a highly respected senior vehicle analyst for the National uh, Natural Resources Defense Council. He's based in uh, New York. I note that today Luke walked here, which is good. So well done, Luke. Uh, and where he studies ways to reduce the envir environmental impacts of the world's transportation system. And again, you can think of that impact as you looked at one of Neil's charts spe specifically on what will happen with uh, liquid uh, transport fuels and what may change that through time. He also uh, served in the U.S. Navy, so that brought him a lot of perspective uh, on operations and propulsion as an officer on a Navy cruiser. So welcome, uh, Luke. Now in our panel, uh, everybody's been given kind of strict instructions, we'll see how we do, to stay within somewhere between five and ten minutes and, uh, and for their opening remarks. That'll give us a, a, a useful perspective and then we'll open the discussion uh, to the panelists for discussion. Uh, I'll ask some questions. The panelists, you're welcome to ask each other uh, questions. And most importantly, we welcome questions uh, from the room. So we're going to leave ample time, I think, for a good and open discussion. And um, with that, I think I'll turn over to you, Dan, to, to, to start off. Speed up our movement from uh, presentations and opening comments to conversation. I'll stay seated. And um, I do think the conference that's been organized here focuses um, on a critical issue at a critical moment, which is the world is changing very fast. A lot of the assumptions we had about what the world would look like uh, in the years ahead have been radically shifted in the last few years, three, four years. So the world going out to 2030 looks very different today from what people asked the same question would have said uh, at the turn of the century, for, ap for example, 15 years ago. Uh, obviously, the biggest piece of that in some regards is the emergence of shale gas, tight oil, and the uh, uh, real revolution in the potential for fossil fuels continuing to play a central role in our energy future for a much longer time than some people had thought. But I think at the same time, we see mounting pressure, despite policy failures, particularly in Washington and to some degree internationally, on the issue of climate change and a growing recognition that that pressure has to be responded to and will be responded to uh, one way or another. And uh, having just come from the experience of working in a state government, um, I feel actually optimistic that the United States is going to respond. And I say that despite the fact that Washington is clearly dithering um, and has not been able to create 
a strategy that really helps grapple with this world of change that's emerged in the energy arena. But I am excited to see um, companies taking these issues on frontally. Uh, Neil's presentation on Shell was a fascinating example of a company stepping up at the heart of this issue in very creative ways. A $40 shadow price on carbon, that's an extremely interesting way for a company to position itself for success in the years ahead and not simply to wait to be buffeted by regulatory change or other factors that might overtake it. And I would tell you, just as companies are stepping up, so too are a number of states. And uh, Connecticut, for example, under Governor Malloy, created for the first time ever a comprehensive energy strategy. Uh, for the longest time, states thought that energy was national policy and it could be left to Washington. Uh, nobody today thinks that that is a wise place to leave your state and to leave its citizens and frankly to leave your businesses in a very competitive marketplace. So you see states stepping up and I think in Connecticut there were some interesting signals about what the policy framework of the future has to look like and how smart governments are aligning incentives to be ready for the change that's coming. Some of it doesn't seem like rocket science, uh, but it is important. For example, um, I was head of a Department of Energy and Environmental Protection. The acronym was DEEP, D-E-E-P. But I used to joke, and the governor actually insisted, that we spell DEEP with three E's. Energy, the environment, and the economy as an integrated set of issues that had to be understood as a package that needed to be thought through on an integrated basis. And I think in the energy arena more broadly, we're seeing a very significant change from a 20th century approach to energy to a new 21st century approach. And to caricature slightly, but not too greatly, the 20th century approach had a bunch of smart folks, some of them at least at the Department of Energy in Washington, uh, from a US perspective this is, trying to pick winners. Winning technologies, winning industries, winning companies. And frankly, the track record is not that bad, but not that good. And uh, we've spent $20 billion as a nation, invested in one big alternative fuel for the future, and it probably everyone in this room knows, um, it is corn-based ethanol. And having just said the 20th century model is to have the government pick winners and it's not a very good thing, I'm willing to pick a loser, and it's corn-based ethanol. <laughs> and I just think the, the energy transfer takes three units of fossil fuel input to get four units of corn-based ethanol out. Uh, the food fuel trade-off it creates, the stress on water systems that I hope we'll get some more on in a few minutes, makes this a loser for sure. So the government picks winners, not on the basis of market logic or sustainability or ability to meet the needs of uh, society over time, but on short-term political logic that almost always is not a good basis for driving major investments. So I think you see in Connecticut a new approach emerging. Not the government picking winners, not subsidy, but a finance approach creating a platform for entrepreneurial activity and relying on our limited government resources or ratepayer funds to leverage private capital. Why is that important? First of all, the government doesn't have enough money to do all the projects, to invest in all the infrastructure, and to uh, support all of the efforts that need to be undertaken. Second, and more importantly, relying on the private sector provides a discipline that governments lack in where the money gets spent. So it transforms completely how you deploy your limited resources. And I think Connecticut's already seen a boom in its clean energy flow of capital into efficiency, into renewables, into fuel switching towards cheaper, cleaner, and more reliable natural gas and out of coal and oil in a way that is quite fascinating. And it's not by accident. It does require kind of a new policy framework. So you see in Connecticut not solar wrecks and wind wrecks, which is the old 20th century model, but a zero emissions renewable energy credit. It requires all technologies to compete against each other. So you're harnessing market forces, competition in particular, to drive down the cost of renewable energy. And I promise you the single most important factor for whether we get to a clean energy future is the pace at which the cost of clean energy, renewable power in any of its forms, comes toward approaches and finally surpasses the price of fossil fuel alternatives, particularly in the generation of power. That's the key to success in this marketplace. And structuring policy incentives to get there is what's absolutely critical. Now, beyond that, Connecticut used uh, a, a set of reverse auctions to drive down costs. It used power purchase agreements as opposed to a renewable portfolio standard to, again, lower costs. And it turns out that some of the 
prevailing wisdom of the 20th century just didn't work. Uh, a renewable portfolio standard, which Connecticut's had for 15 years, ratcheting up the percent of power that's meant to be renewable uh, up to 20% by 2020, has produced zero grid-scale renewable energy projects in 15 years. Zero. No wind projects, no solar arrays, because it's a target. It's a timetable. It's a command and control approach. It doesn't work. What did work was saying the state would like to purchase renewable energy. All of you who have projects, tell us what you can do and at what cost, and we will give you, if you are the low bidder, a 15- or 20-year contract to sell power in the state of Connecticut. So the number of people that were able to get projects financed when they had a, a renewable energy portfolio standard to point to in Connecticut, zero. Once you have a contract in hand, you can go to a bank and borrow $100 million to build a wind farm. Very different approach. So we are seeing new tools that work, a more integrated strategy, a focus on a portfolio approach to the future. There will be a fossil fuel dimension to it for some many years to come. But we are at the same time ramping up renewable energy, ramping up efficiency. And by the way, after years of a very slow ramp, we saw a tenfold increase in the pace at which renewable energy is being deployed at the household scale and the grid scale in the last couple of years as opposed to the years prior to that. We also are seeing a need for integration not only of strategy but of states. Um, it doesn't work for each state to do this on their own. We're waiting for a national, a national program that's not coming. So you now have the New England states banding together, investing again in a portfolio approach that has uh, trans uh, the transmission lines being built, has gas pipelines being built, is really designed to ensure that the state is going to be able to benefit from the markets that are out there and the prices that are prevailing in some places. And I just point out natural gas, because of the growing supply, uh, is selling in New York today at prices under the benchmark Henry Hub in the Gulf. The price in New England, double that. This is a bottleneck problem and an infrastructure issue. So the New England states are working together to overcome that. My bottom line, and really what I offer as the key to the 21st century strategy, is the need to think about innovation more broadly than it was in the 20th century. A lot of push was put on technology development, remains important. We want to continue to see venture capital, not so much government money, but venture capital going into breakthrough technologies. But we need innovation as well in finance, which is why Connecticut set up a green bank to do these kind of creative financing. Uh, we need creative policies, new frameworks of incentives. We need innovation in how we engage the public in the marketing of clean energy. So it's innovation broadly in the entire ecosystem of energy that is what's going to get us to a transformed future and is allow us to manage these fast-changing issues that we see around us. Thank you. Dan, um, I think we will uh, have a lot of good discussion on um, winners versus losers. Uh, economics trumping uh, others. This portfolio approach is an essential approach, and it's great to see the success that uh, it's helped deliver uh, in, in Connecticut. And I think the, uh, clearly as we talk and look towards China, things like looking at infrastructure and uh, the challenges of distributing to different markets will become a, a, a common theme. Mm -hmm.